Let's just give them a moment to mm -hmm. come in. Folks are still coming in. Wow, we got a lot of attendees. We do? We have five. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so, real. I love that we say five is like. <laughs> Holy moly. I think after about 15 Oh, two of them are counselors. They don't count. <laughs> they don't count. That's fine. <laughs> All right, see you, right, 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 right. Thank you. All right, you guys. I calm watch down, my hair. Calm down. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Athena. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call, I try to call this meeting of GOL to order. It is actually 10:33 um, on May 5th, and uh, this meeting is being recorded. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of GOL is being conducted by remote participation. Um, I'm going to just take a moment, make sure everybody can be heard. Um, and so, and I believe we have at least one guest attendee. Uh, I see Rabia here. I don't see Corey, um, but let's start with- Corey and Shalini are in the attendees. All right, so if we could bring uh, Corey and Shalini in, um, because we're gonna start with them in just a moment. Um, but let me begin by just making sure my colleagues can be heard. So, um, Mandy? Present. And Pat? I'm here. And Darcy? Here. Okay, and the chair is here. I don't see Sarah at the moment. So if she comes in, we will uh, check with her. We haven't, uh, I think, Pat, you were going to text her, but you haven't gotten a response, I take it. Okay. All right, well, we're gonna get started. Um, so I just don't wanna check and make sure that our guests, so we have a, a number of guests this morning who are here for a very particular item. We're gonna start with that item in just a moment. Um, so let me just touch on the agenda briefly and then I'm going to make sure our guests can be heard and then we'll get started. Um, so let me just put the agenda up on the screen. Um, that should be this guy. Bear with me for a second. So you should see um, the agenda here. If I can move it. Okay. There we go. Can everybody see that? Should be bigger. Um, no. We're going to start with the uh, the, the uh, Gorse Children's Center um, resolution, and our guests are here for that. Um, then we're going to turn to uh, Race Amity Day. That I don't think should take too long. Also, um, I'm going to move um, the item under not anticipated. We've gotten the audit review committee charge again. That should not take long, but we this is time sensitive, so I'm going to move that up um, after number three. And then we're going to turn to the DAB, which also is time sensitive. Um, and I will probably skip the proclamation calendar draft, though I'm happy to share it. I'm so proud of it, um, but it still has work. And then we're going to turn to, um, in the second hour, the hope is to get immediately to the uh, OCA process that we are working on. Um, so that's the agenda. Um, there is a set of minutes that uh, we can review if we have time. I'm not sure that any of you have seen them, though. Um, but we'll check on that later. So that's the agenda. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing that and I'm going to close it and I'm going to put up the uh, resolution in just a second. Share screen. All right. So the resolution should be visible on your screen. And I'm going to just, if you'll bear with me. So I see, Corey, can you uh, be heard and can you speak? Sure. Thank you. So I was checking with and Rabia. Hey, everyone. Good, thank you. And Shalini? Yes, I'm here, right. thank you. You're welcome. Um, is there anyone in the audience? I guess that's a question for um, my colleagues who can check that easier than I can. <laughs> Is there anyone in the audience that would like to participate in this discussion? There was the thought that one or two parents might um, be present. 
Can anyone see if they raise their hands under share screen? I have a hard time finding that sort of thing. I don't know if anybody else is better at it than I am. There's just there are three people in the audience. One person has just raised their hand. So Katia, if we could, uh, is Katia one of the parents oh, that you? And Tanya also just raised her hand. All right. So um, we, if with permission of my colleagues, these are parents apparently who have uh, children at the Gorse, and so I thought that we could bring them in um, if they wish to speak or have any questions. Um, so if we could bring them both in, thank you very much. So Katya and Tanya, welcome. Um, thank you. Ask everyone to stay muted for the moment, um, but then once we open it up, we usually have everybody unmuted unless things get, get too wild. Um, the way we proceed is that we go through this um, pretty much whereas by whereas. Um, and uh, then if there are any questions from the, the committee or any suggested changes, we, we talk to the sponsors to make sure they're okay with it. Um, so that's how we're gonna proceed. Um, so let's take a look at, this is the resolution opposing the closure of the Gorse Children's Center at Mount Holyoke College. And I have a general question um, and here my colleagues can weigh in if they'd like to, how they'd like to proceed. Um, normally we just look at, what we look at is whether this is clear, consistent and actionable. That's our remit, that's what we do. But there is some leeway here, especially if we're the only body who looks at it before it goes to the council. And the question I have is really not about the clarity, consistency or really actionability. Um, it's about the appropriateness of this um, for the council. So I don't know if that's where people want to start or whether they want to go through this first and then come back to that question. Um, I'd like to address that first um, and hear from the sponsors and hear from my colleagues uh, first if they have any concerns. But my first question is just a broad one. Why should the Amherst Town Council be weighing in on this? So, um, the hand, raise hand function is, is available to you, um, but I kind of just prefer people raising their hands. Um, I think I see one of my colleagues. I see two of my colleagues. I'm gonna start with Darcy. Darcy, if you would uh, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just wondering why we would look at the substance of the issue as GOL. Um, I, I do, you know, there is a question of like, um, like if this resolution is sponsored by a counselor, it automatically gets referred to GOL. We're only supposed to look at clarity, consistency, and actionability. So um, I think there's some, it seems like yeah. then, it, then we send it to the council, then they could ask for the, I mean, obviously, we, we'll see what the substance is as we go along, but I, I guess I don't know why we would be specifically asking about that as a, as a threshold issue if that's not our charge. Pat? You're Thank muted, you. Pat. Sorry, apologies. Um, I think George's question is a reasonable one. Um, and it is, um, this is actually, I, I will say that I am in support of this, um, 100%. But I still think George's question is important. And I would like to hear not from a counselor, even Chalonet, who's one of the sponsors, but from the other, Corey or um, or Rebe uh, Rebea about this, uh, why they feel it's appropriate. The other thing, Darcy, I'm going to take issue with you about substantive. Uh, you bring it up when it's convenient for you, but you don't mind making substantive uh, changes or decisions, um, as I said, when they're good for you. You don't like it when you think something you want isn't going to happen. 
We're not changing anything. We're asking a question about appropriateness. I've been asked this question about a resolution I'm hoping to bring before the council because it's a national issue, not even local. And to me, Mount Holyoke is local. Uh, so I, I, I really need you to think about why you interject with that only when it's convenient to you. I'm just putting forward what the charge of this um, this committee is, and I'd appreciate it, Pat, if you did not attack me all the time. Well, Darcy, I, I hear you, but um, there is some wiggle room here, as we've experienced over the years on this committee, um, and it does seem to me that, um, you know, when these matters come before us, it's not an unreasonable question to ask um, whether this is something that is appropriate for the council. Um, just, and I happen to think that it, that it is, but I really, it is an honest question. Um, imagine if this were about the closure of a children's center in Newton or, you know, in, in, Brain, in Braintree or whatever. Um, you know, we'd probably say, well, we're very sympathetic, but it's not hard to see how the Amherst Town Council should be weighing in on this. Are we going to weigh in on every, uh, you know, closure of a child children's center throughout the state? Um, I think in this case, there's a good answer to this, but I think it's a question that needs to be asked, which is why I asked it. Um, I understand that our charge is fairly specific, but uh, in our experience, we've often found the line is, is not a clear one. And certainly we are sort of the, you know, the, the, the uh, not necessarily the, the barrier, but but just we're the place where you know it seems a reasonable place for us to ask um, for any resolution, proclamation, whatever. Um, is this appropriate to the council? And um, so that's why I raised it. So I'd like. Uh, sorry, Mandy. Um, I agree with Darcy um, that whether we think this is an appropriate resolution for a council to act on or not is not necessarily within our charge unless we believe it is unactionable. And that's sometimes where that line gets fuzzy is, is something actionable. And, and I will say on this one, um, there's, I don't see anything unactionable about it. Um, and so our council has made a decision that we look for clarity, consistency, and actionability without regard to whether or not we support such a resolution and whether or not that means we as a committee believe it is a resolution that the council should or should not act upon as long as the council, as long as the resolution or you know, citation or whatever has a council or sponsor, we are looking at clarity, consistency, and actionability. And so I I would in some sense say we should move on to clarity, consistency and actionability and maybe put in the report which we've done in the past that such a vote has no bearing on whether the committee believes the appropriateness of the resolution or not. All right. Um... I don't see any of my colleagues. So um, one of our guests, and please, I can't, um, this computer is gonna drive me crazy. Corey, I'm sorry, please, if you'd go ahead. Sure, well, I'm, I'm not sure if, if it would be appropriate now to speak to the question of, of relevance or whether we, we can wait on that, but we, we believe it's relevant. I can talk to that if that's helpful. I know, I know, I realize you've heard two different views here, so it puts you in an awkward position. Um, let's go through this line by line, and then um, we'll see where we stand at that point. Thank you. Um, I see Katya's hand raised, but that may be from um, the previous. Thank you. Um, and at the moment, that's the only other hand I see raised. And it's also Tanya, if you could take your hand down, that would be appreciated, unless you wish to speak, and then uh, you can be recognized. Tanya, do you wish to speak? Uh, no. Okay, but thank you. Um, all right. 
I've read through this. I don't have any particular issues with the language. I don't know if anyone does. We'll go through it. Uh, whereas by whereas, Mount Holyoke has decided to suspend childcare at the Gorse Children's Center. And whereas the college has reevaluated the plan and extended their current contract through June 2022. Again, people should speak up. And at this point, I think my colleague should just speak up because. Oh, okay. So Mandy, please go a ahead. Couple. First one is there's one counselor sponsor, so we should singularize counselor. Okay. Ball. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Um, and then I, I'm going to be bringing this up when referencing the college or the center, I think college and center should be capitalized because it's a specific location, not college in general. So that would be the second whereas, and then the third whereas for center, the second whereas for college. Thank you. Let's go ahead. And that's all I have till the fifth one. Okay, as the college the plan extended the current contract for June, and was there any other change the, there? That was it. Was that the correct? third, whereas the oh, center. Center, thank you. Again, to my colleagues who are present uh, in the committee, just speak up because I can't see uh, hands and type at the same time. Among the many things I can't do at the same time. Um, where's the decision to close? Gorse came at a time when child care in the Valley has become increasingly scarce. Okay, and whereas Gorse is one of the only local programs that provides full year extended day coverage that includes infant care, it has provided critical, it has proved critical, sorry, to essential workers during the pandemic. Right there. Yep. I found that sentence kind of strange. Okay. So I would replace it with and. It's almost two sentences sort of right. mashed together. Okay, let me read it again and see what the sponsors think with the change. Gorse is one of the only local programs that provides full year extended day coverage that includes infant care and it has proved critical to essential workers during the pandemic. That could be a separate whereas. Yeah, it could be. But yeah. instead of doing that, I just put and in there. <laughs> okay. all right. Any thoughts from the sponsors at all? Just speak up. Please don't. Uh... Fine with that change. Okay. All right. I'm going to make that change. Okay. See how we spell and. Okay. Whereas it appears that there are not enough full time slots at other centers to accommodate the 80 plus families that will lose their care. And where is this? Colon instead of comma. Oh, thank you. And whereas the center employs more than two dozen skilled child care providers from our community whose careers will be endangered by the closure. Okay. And whereas uh, studies have repeatedly demonstrated that women are disproportionately affected by the closure of daycare, accounting for 80% of the 1.1 million Americans who have dropped out of the workforce since COVID began, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. That whereas needs a comma after whereas. Thank you. Whereas based on current data, we believe that, are you all seeing that uh, irritating? Probably are. Whereas based on current data, we believe that the consequences of closing Gorse even another year hence will have an inordinate impact on women and therefore constitute an issue of equity that impacts the entire community. All right, I'm using my different mouse today. It's making my life really difficult. Oh, there it is. So far, so good. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Amberstown Council strongly urges Mount Holyoke College to collaborate with stakeholders in the interim extension year. 
We have further resolved that the Amherst Town Council calls on Mount Holyoke College to not remove children, child care options from the women and families of the broader community. We have further resolved the Amherst Town Council urges Mount Holyoke College to develop a sustainable plan for the course Children's Center beyond June 2022. We have further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to Governor Charlie Baker, State Senator Joanne Comerford, State Representative Mindy Dom, and President of Mount Holyoke College, Sonia Stevens. Any other concerns, questions with that material, with that section? See any from anyone? All right. In my experience with these kinds of resolutions, uh, we are now going to be um, at least reading part of this at the next council meeting. Uh, for our sponsors' sake, in case they've not attended a council meeting, these usually go on the consent agenda and that's where they get approved and there is no public recognition or statement made. And we on GOL have asked that that be changed and that for every proclamation, every, at least every resolution, proclamation, citation, commemoration, there be a brief, uh, we would not read the entire document, but we would introduce it briefly and um, read the, the resolved section. And we normally would ask the council sponsor to do that. In this case, Shalini would be invited to, to do that. And I hope she would do that. Um, I guess that's one of the reasons I raised my question is that because of that's been our practice and because this is not um, usually, these are not usually discussed by the council. Um, I would like to address the issue of relevance in my report. So at the moment I cannot, and I will not unless it's raised in discussion. I've asked the question, we've gotten a somewhat um, conflicting response. The committee's not of one mind here. Um, so I'm not gonna force the issue, but again, I just would restate that if I were a counselor and I can imagine one or two from my experience who might wonder why we're acting on this. I think the document actually gives good reasons in it why we are. Um, but I was hoping that we would have a chance to talk about that. So uh, unless there's any further thought on this, um, I'm going to go take a motion, entertain a motion to approve this. Um, my colleagues have any thoughts? Shalini has her hand raised. Shalini, please go ahead. Um couple of thoughts so i i have to say that even i'm confused now about the discussion because and i think it's important to clarify whether um that question of relevance will be dealt here at gol in my mind it was a gol actually and now i'm mandy joe and darcy clarify that it's not so and then we're not going to discuss it even in council probably or maybe they will i don't think they will but i think it's important to for somewhere for it to be said why this is an important issue and i think it's also an opportunity for uh, you know like it's not our job to dictate what mount holyoke decides but i think it we are seeing that we're all interconnected and interdependent and it's important for the council the government and the local institutions the colleges and universities to be working together with our constituents. So I think it's an important place, the GOL discussion today, where we listen to the parents of why they are asking for this and it's documented and hopefully someone at Mount Holyoke will read it. And so it does get communicated. This is what we're thinking. This is why this is so important for how it's impacting women and therefore children and our communities and how it's impacting uh, families of color or people with lower means or and how it's impacting the jobs in our town. So it is impacting Amherst, of course, because of families who live here and work there and their kids and it's impacting uh, people who 
will lose their jobs who are also probably living in our community. And so it, it is all very interconnected. And I think we need to highlight that and bring the institutions and colleges into that conversation. So I would love to hear the parents and why would they have to say about it, if that's okay. Again, just begging the guests uh, indulgence here. Um, as I said, just because a counselor sponsors an item like this by itself, in my mind, doesn't resolve the question of relevance. Um, I think that there are very good reasons for why we should be weighing in on this, but um, we will not actually have them articulated here unless we talk about it. Um, and so Shalini has said something that I could include in my report, um, but I'd like to hear very much from the parents but um, what I'm basically asking them is uh, at this point, no longer about the language of this, which is you know, perfectly beautifully written. We've made a few minor changes, which is the sort of thing we usually do. Um, but I really wanna hear from them about my question of why we, the Amherstown Council should be weighing in on this. And I don't know any other place where that can be raised. Um, Shalini is correct. It would not be raised at council unless, and maybe it would happen. Maybe one of our colleagues would pull this out of the consent agenda and then during the discussion would raise that question. And that's one way it could be raised. Um, but it does seem to me that, um, and here there may be just a disagreement amongst members of the committee, that this is a question that GOL should, should talk about. Um, the fact that an individual counselor has sponsored something by itself in my mind is not sufficient to settle the issue of relevance. Um, so, I would like to hear from the parents. I've invited them here, um, and uh, but I need to hear from my colleagues first. Mandy. Yeah, so it, in some sense, I agree with everything you're saying, George, but I don't think GOL is the place to have that conversation. I think that's the council or some other committee. We've in the past dealt with resolutions or proclamations that we thought were doing binding decisions that we've potentially recommended that the council send to another committee to deal with the substantive matter of it, of whether that is a binding decision the council should be doing. Um, and such such a concern has been noted in a report. Um, so I, I can tell you that I am still unsure whether I'd let this go through on consent. It is something that I might myself pull off of consent because I have concerns. Um, I just, I. I'm not sure this is the committee to air those concerns because of what our charge is. You don't think that actionability covers this in the broadest sense? As I said, imagine that for whatever reason, a counselor is- Well, there's nothing in this charge that we can't act on. That's that's the thing. It's it's This is where I'm struggling because I think right. you could argue it goes to actionability, but I think you could also argue that there's nothing that there's nothing written here that the council can't take a vote on because it would be illegal to take a vote on. And when you look at our guidance on actionability, it's generally does it conflict with some other policy we've enacted, or does it conflict with our own laws, or does it conflict with the state laws or something or federal laws that would create something that we can't actually act on? And I see nothing in this that would do that. It's more of to me each individual counselors and the council as a whole as to whether they as a body or an individual believe this is something the council should act on and should is different than can. But it seems that, that we're the place where that conversation can start and in the report from GOL, it gives the counselors some sense of what we have discussed um, and may either um, encourage them to pull it off the consent agenda or in this case, I think it would probably convince them that uh, given the discussion and the report, um, there's no reason to pull it off the consent agenda. I mean, again, give the example of say this were Newton or you know, uh, you know, where or someplace, um, you know, it seems a not unreasonable question for this committee to ask, why is this before us? Um, and so I guess I really am struggling here with the idea that somehow we can't even ask that question. Um, I think it actually, well, anyway, that's where obviously we disagree. So, Shalini, your hand is up. So, so many things, but I think we've invited parents of uh, and, and co-sponsors uh, resident sponsors here to 
share their perspective. And I think they deserve that whether you can do anything about it or not is fine. But we, we have to extend the courtesy of listening to what, or do we say no, because it's not related to our charge, we're not gonna listen to you. Uh, I don't think that makes any sense. I'm sorry, this is happening. So as you all can see, we are still figuring things out mm -hmm. over here and that's fine. And that's the diversity of perspective helps. And you can see everyone does a very thorough job here takes the job really seriously, it's a good thing. But I think we need to uh, at least hear, and you don't have to do anything about it as George, just write it down. So we are, our agendas are so packed in council that relying on the possibility that someone will pull it out and we will have the discussion, I think is doing a disfavor to the people who put this forward and to our goal of letting Mount Holyoke know and build this that conversation, have this conversation. So I don't think we should think of it being pulled out and then the parents will speak then. I think we should ask them to speak here and you don't have to do anything. It will be at least documented. And then, yeah. And this of course begs the question at a later point, maybe GOL and council need to decide where it should this conversation be happening because clearly this is not clear. It is not clear. Okay. All right. Thank you, Shauna. Um, so I'm going to, unless my colleagues object and they may raise their hands and object, I'm going to invite um, the guests that we have invited to this meeting to speak briefly to this uh, uh, resolution um, in whatever way they wish, um, since almost certainly they will not have the opportunity to do that at the council meeting. And um, so, um, I'm looking for any hands or, uh, yeah, so, but also first for my colleagues, because I'm basically taking advantage of my authority as the chair um, to uh, invite our guests to speak. I think Corey had a hand up. Yes, I, I see that. I'm just making sure that, that my colleagues are willing to indulge me, which they don't have to do. All right, seeing no objections. I've been okay. supportive from the beginning of no, their- I understand, I, understand. I appreciate Let's that. Um, yeah, okay. Corey, thank you. Would you please go right ahead and speak? Thank you so much. And we understand that um, the conversation and appreciate the chance to, to just speak briefly. Um, I, I'll just come at that question from kind of a micro and macro perspective. The micro is um, that my family is um, directly impacted by this closure. Um, I live at 44 Dennis Drive. I have two children um, who both attended Gorse. Um, my daughter is three and she's currently attending and my, so my son is at Crocker Farm now in kindergarten. And I grew up here and I'm a graduate of the public schools here. Um, this center has been around for, I believe like half a century, <laughs> a very long time and various iterations. And it serves approximately 80, or more families who are currently served. And then there's also, a, I would have mentioned, a very extensive wait list. So we know um, represented here are four families that currently have kids at the center who live in Amherst. There are also um, at least four more who are actively involved in this group, who are of, of parents organizing to save the center, who either uh, work or live in Amherst. And we know there are, there are many more. Unfortunately, the um, the company that runs the center can't provide us with the full list, but um, there are a number of families impacted directly in Amherst and the surrounding area. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, when I became pregnant with my first child, I was full, working full time as was my partner and we needed a place where we could get full time year round uh, infant care. And Gorse was one of the few options for that, which is why we ended up there. And that's the case for, I think a lot of families. Um, you'll see now, um, you know, so going to the macro, you'll see now there's a major shortage of childcare across the board in the Valley. On the Amherst Parent Listserv, almost every week, there's someone particularly looking for infant care, um, and it's really hard to find. Since the pandemic hit, as you know, centers have closed, centers have had to reduce capacity due to the CDC guidelines. And so when, Gore, uh, when the college announced in February that they were going to be closing the center in June, like many parents, I 
panicked and went looking for care for my daughter. And I approached all of the child care centers in Amherst and in the surrounding area. And there were zero spots available for her for that uh, time in June when the center was gonna close. So um, we know that uh, this impacts um, not just the families that are currently in care, but also the, the families out there looking for care. Um, and we know that the child care shortage um, uh, goes way beyond just this moment in the pandemic, but, but continues, um, will continue after the pandemic. Um, so, so also on the macro side, I just wanted to mention, um, we believe this, uh, this issue disproportionately impacts women. Um, we know as, as is stated in the resolution that more, many more women have ha had to lose their jobs or come out of the workforce during the pandemic. And we know that this center in particular serves a large number of essential workers. Um, just in our, our group of parents, we have firefighters, we have EMTs, we have military, we have teachers, we have uh, just a number of, of folks who had to work through the pandemic and needed this type of um, full day, full year care. Um, so it's a real issue of equity for both essential workers and women. Um, and as such, the town of Hadley recently approved through their diversity, equity and inclusion committee, a similar uh, letter, which was sent to the college. So we believe it is locally relevant. Um, and we just think that this is a really important way that the town can, can weigh in on behalf of some of us who are really uh, struggling to find care. Thank you, Corey. Bravia. Thank you. Thank you all so much for making time for us today. I know there's a lot happening in Amherst right now, so really appreciate the time to, to hear from us and giving us a chance. Um, so similar to Corey, I um, have a very personal story with the center and um, as well as with sort of the, our, the condition of how our childcare is right now. Um, we moved to the, the, um, the area about five years ago when my daughter was six months old and my husband took a position at Mount Holyoke College. We were able to move here as a family because the Gorse Children's Center had early childhood infant care for my six month old. Um, otherwise we were planning to remain in New Jersey and he would commute both ways, but it was very specific to our decision to move here. When we moved here, we knew very early on that if we were to settle in the area, we wanted to settle in Amherst. Um, there's really no other town that we considered um, because of the high quality child uh, sort of educational system in the schools here, um, as well as the focus on diversity and equity within this town. Um, so Gorse was very central to our decision to move and now stay in, in the area. Um, my husband, as I mentioned, is a professor at Mount Holyoke College, and, the, and because he's a faculty there, the center um, has relationship with the college in which they offer full-time full care for any day that um, school is in session. Um, it follows the same sort of guidance for any faculty meetings. It'll be open late. It has um, extended care during spring breaks for school-age children. It has care for... Um, uh, summer camps for children who need that support. So it really is extremely supportive of the working family. And it is one of the only centers I have found in the area that provides that. Um, and although I work in Amherst and my husband works in Mount Holyoke, we are willing to travel um, to the center and back um, to drop off our children because the quality is so, so strong. Um, the teachers, the director, the, the curriculum is, is really like unlike any others that, that, um, we, that we have found. Um, when the center, when the note was sent out that it was closing in February, um, when the note was sent out in February that it would close in June, it caused a major panic amongst families. Um, as, as Corey mentioned, a lot of working families and working mothers have been disproportionately effective and still are affected by the pandemic with our children just like Corey and our kids just going back to elementary school three weeks ago. Um, and so having the center open gives us a lifeline to continue with our careers, continue to support our families and literally drop, drop off our six month old in a place that is so supportive and welcoming. Um, and we feel very, really comfortable doing that. Um, and I think it's relevant for Amherst for mainly because a lot of families live in Amherst and rely on, on care there. And I know there are a lot of families who are 
affiliated with the college there right now that are planning to move to Amherst in the future and will continue to keep young children there because of the quality of care, because it's a spot that's available for them when so many centers in the area have closed um, during the pandemic. So thank you so much for taking time to hear from us and for your time on this topic. Thank you. Um, any questions from my colleagues about anything that has been said? I was wondering whether Tanya or Katia wanted to say anything. Um, they're certainly welcome to speak um, if they wish. Um, just need to raise your hand and, un or un and unmute, actually. Or just unmute. Katia, please go ahead. Thank you for having us. Um, Corey and Rabia said it very well. The infant care and the extended hours uh, are really were a lifeline for me when I went back to work. I now live in Amherst um, and I've actually lived in Amherst the whole time that I've had a child and he's gone to Gorse uh, because of the quality of care and the extended hours. I also want to say that um, I think Gorse is a very, uh, is diverse for the area because of its affiliation with the college because the faculty bring diversity to the area. And during COVID um, we took my son out of Gorse first completely and we're just having him at home because my parents were here. And then we put him in a small center very close to our house because I wasn't going to work and because they only had nine kids and two teachers. So I was worried about the virus. So I took him out during that time and a, and a big cost was, was the diversity that he would have had. He would have been in classes with um, families that were from different races, from different cultures and also from different economic um, uh, Areas. So I just wanted to mention that as a real strength and something that we've walked to the center for. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Tanya, please go ahead. Tanya, you we'll go? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you need to unmute yeah, you yourself. Unmute. Please go ahead. Okay, sorry. No, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, actually, um, 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 so I just basically want to add something uh, to the relevance issue. Um, my son was sent to Amherst uh, Mount Holyoke. Uh, no, 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 Amherst Montessori School when he was 15. Um, months old, um, but he stayed there for a year and later uh, we found out that the philosophy and culture there didn't fit him very well. So we started to look for a new um, daycare center for him. We've lost you. Um, we've lost the audio. Tanya, we can't hear you. Anything at your end, Athena, that you can do here? Um, no, I'm sorry. I there's no way for me to, to to look and see what's going on with her computer. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I'm sorry. Um, again, I appreciate very much um, the opportunity to um, hear you, your voices, and uh, I'm prepared to go immediately to a motion uh, to declare the resolution opposing the closure of the Gorse Children's Center at Mount Holyoke College to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Is there a second? Second. There's a second, thank you, Darcy. And I'm going to go immediately to vote, and I'm going to begin um, with Pat. Yes, but I'd like the opportunity to talk about appropriateness after the guests leave. Uh, okay, we can certainly discuss that. I think they've probably heard enough about that already. Um, so Pat, if you would. I said yes. Thank you, sorry. Andy? Aye. Darcy? Yes. And the chair is a yes. And Sarah, I believe, is still absent. 
So the vote is 4-0 with one absent. Um, again, our thanks to our guests uh, for coming. This is took a little longer than it usually does, but it raised a very important question that I think has um, advocates on both sides. I think there's a strong case for both. So um, I appreciate your, your patience and I very much personally appreciate uh, your testimony. Um, but the co my colleagues and I will talk about that in just a moment. So um, thank you. This will be acted on at the uh, next council meeting. Um, I believe Shalini will read it. I hope she will. Um, and uh, you're certainly welcome to be in the audience. And uh, it's, this is done early in the meeting, so you have to sit through a few minutes of uh, bureaucratic uh, stuff. But we do do um, proclamations and such at the top of the meeting. And if you're in the audience, um, Shalini can certainly acknowledge you, um, and, which is also uh, something we'd like to do, but there's no obligation to attend. But it will be at the, uh, what is the date? Colleagues, help me. Um, 17th. Thank you, thank you. The 17th is when this will be acted on. All right, thank you all. It's a quick question, George. Please, go ahead. Do you think uh, it's going to be helpful for the parents to speak, or do they not need to speak at the public comment in the council? I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, and if it does get pulled off the agenda um, and become an issue before the council, right. um, that would certainly be valuable. So yes, I think it's an excellent suggestion. Stani, you're certainly free during public comment. Uh, which again comes even before proclamations, um, is yeah. to just uh, you know acknowledge that it's on the agenda and state briefly why you. I think that's an excellent suggestion. That would be an opportunity for you simply to state what you've stated very very eloquently here. Um, so that's another consideration to come and, and speak during public comment. Okay, so since the guests have left, should I then write? I'll just write to them and let them know yes, to that, that to do great. that. Okay. That would be great. All right, should I leave so you all can discuss? But I'm well, also not clear about this, so do let me know what what you all decide or yeah, Melanie, so I can just move you to the to the attendees if that's okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. All right, Pat, you had raised your hand and you wanted to say something. Yes, so well, you. first of all, I do owe uh, Darcy an apology for attacking. Um, <laughs> and I, I had some difficulty with when I notice what I consider hypocrisy, but I should not have done that publicly. Um, I feel like the speakers showed us why their statements of appropriateness were needed by this group of counselors and why it was not inappropriate uh, to have them share those things. We are not making a substantive decision. We are looking at time and efficiency. And it is incredibly inefficient to ask sponsors and parents, um, uh, resident sponsors, to attend more than one meeting, um, unless GOL can't re reach some kind of resolution. Yet both Mandy and Darcy were willing to say, oh, well, we are gonna make this motion, we're gonna decide this on uh, actionability, consistency and clarity, but you have to go to another committee. That's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. Um, why should a person who is presenting a resolution not be allowed to speak to why they feel like it's appropriate and important? That's what they're there for. That's what we need to hear. We would not have, if we sat here and every one of us thought it was inappropriate to bring to the council, but it was actionable, it was consistent, and it was clear, we would not have stopped it. And I'm very, very frustrated um, by the way um, this committee gets attacked and I'm frustrated by uh, the need to make a simple process more complex than is needed. There is no committee that needed to hear that those 
stories and uh, facts and information before GOL looked at this. Uh, that's for now, that's what I have to say. Uh, Mandy, go ahead. So I basically agree with you, Pat, except we've got a charge. This, 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 is, this is the struggle I think many of us, especially George, you and I have had for the last three years or two and a half years since this committee was formed. Um, no, I've been in that struggle too. About, what can we talk about? What can't we? And, and that's why I say I basically agree with you because I'd love our charge to be able to talk about relevancy. Um, you know, I'd love the charge to be changed. And so I struggle with it because yes, I want our committee, our council meetings to be, um, you know, succinct and efficient, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I don't want residents to have to go to multiple committees. I don't think this needed to go to a different committee, but when the council has repeatedly told this committee that we're not supposed to be talking about that, which to me is a very frustrating thing to begin with, um, then I struggle with, should we be talking about it? Or will we, when this comes to council and George writes his report, will we face more concerns of what, did, why were you talking about relevancy? Because that's not part of your charge. Um, and so maybe the issue is we need to just propose an amendment to our charge. Um, I can agree with amending the charge. However, I can imagine a GOL, which I've been on from the beginning and struggling with this from the beginning, will be criticized for doing something that it's not supposed to do by the very people who, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm yeah. really kind of sick and tired of the baloney. Well, I think, no, Darcy raised the- really And yes, I support yeah. changing the charge. We'll yeah. see what happens. No, Darcy raised a really important point. So and it, it's not, um, not easily resolved. Darcy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, I was under the impression that we just generally uh, didn't invite um, the, the, well, invited this, I, I've seen in the past that we invite sponsors to be able to respond to our questions as we go through looking at consistency, clarity, and actionability. But we have specifically said to those sponsors, you're not presenting this is not a time to present. That'll be for another committee. You know, that'll be when you go to when this goes to the to the council. So it would be good for us to be consistent with what we tell the sponsors of these things because we just spent almost an hour on a resolution um, where we I think we we may have given the sponsors the wrong impression of what our job is. Um, and, um, and, and Pat, you're apologizing to me and accusing me of a hypocrite in the same sentence does not really fly. Um, so I, I would appreciate if you really did stop attacking me when I'm just putting forward what the charge of this committee is. That's what the charge is. We don't look at the substance. Well, it's, it's actually not that simple, but um... For those of us who've been on this committee since the beginning, there have been a number of occasions where that line has been not is not clear, and we have certainly crossed it. And uh, uh, but you raise a good question. I guess just a question for you, Darcy, is where do you think this should should this have gone to TSO? Where should this kind of thing go? My, you know, we just we just said that the the sponsor the sponsors are going to come to the. A uh, town council meeting. They're going to give public comment. They'll be if it if it gets taken off the consent agenda. They'll be there for questions if necessary. Right. Um, to me, that's the place. Um, not in in GOL. Hmm. At least not if we don't have a, an amended charge. If our charge gets amended, then that's a different Fair thing. Enough. Yeah. Let me ask you one other question. And I think you're right. We need to move on. If this had been for uh, some you know, where or someplace where clearly or, or arguably it doesn't really impact the community of Amherst directly, but a council sponsor, a councilor has sponsored it and it's in front of GOL. What would you suggest? Basically, we just look at it from clear clarity, consistency, and so called action, even though 
uh, any reasonable person other than the council sponsor um, would think that this is really has nothing to do with Amherst and is not an appropriate thing for the council to address. Your thoughts would, I'm sorry? We might be able to say it wasn't actionable then. Well, that's uh, why I raised it here because, and I, I think I knew the answer, but I wanted the answer to be made public and I wanted to give, um, but anyway, uh, Mandy, I'm sorry, you raised your hand. Yeah, so I would say we would do exactly what we did this time, which is declare it clear, consistent, and actionable because it is actionable because there's nothing stopping us from weighing in on something in Newton, something, you know, we've we've done resolutions about President Trump, former President Trump. We we did a Springfield right. resolution on biomass. Right. We've done stuff way out. And, Palmer, and that's my Palmer point Palmer of it's, it's not yeah. our committee's job to make that decision. It's each no. individual counselors at the time of the vote at the council to decide whether it's relevant mm -hmm. enough for that counselor to vote yes, vote no, or abstain because they don't want to muck up the process, but then they themselves don't feel that it's relevant for a vote. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We'll come back to this. I think that, that uh, it's, it's going to need further discussion, but I, I hear both Darcy and Mandy um, that uh, we've, I've probably had a step over our boundaries today. So those are grounds for removing the chair. And so um, just put that out nice there. Nice try, so, George, uh, but that's not going to happen. Uh, oh, I just a, a suggestion. You wish. Just, <laughs> right. yeah, okay. Well, I'll keep, I'm keep trying. I'll keep trying. <laughs> All right, we just, let's move ahead. Uh, appreciate your patience. We have a race Amity Day proclamation. This has been before us on numerous occasions. This I think we should be able to deal with fairly quickly, but maybe I shouldn't say anything. Let me just get it up on the screen. Um, and uh, I share screen. All right. And so, Get this ready for. Um, if we need track changes, it's ready. So, council sponsors, uh, Councillor Alyssa Brewer, it's Race Amity Day annual proclamation. Community sponsors, Ash Hartwell, Amherst Citizens for Racial Equity Now. Could you make it a little bigger? Sure. I, I mean, I've read it, but I, it's. I, I no, know. absolutely, absolutely. Um, Zoom, put it at 150. How's that? We can do 200. Is that okay, Pat? Okay. Um, whereas the greatest asset of the town of Amherst is its people, and whereas the town of Amherst holds dear the motto of the United States of America, E pluribus unum out of many one, recognizing the principle, whoops, recognizing the principle of the oneness of human, of the humankind. I would assume that would be of humankind. Of the chair, indifferent. And the rich cultural, ethnic and racial diversity of its inhabitants. I would take that out. Any thoughts? Take what out? The? Yes. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. Whereas civility, respect, kindness, and friendship are commonly shared values of the collective citizenry of the town of Amherst, and whereas the town of Amherst invites communities and neighborhoods to join in reflection on the beauty and richness of our diverse cultures and ethnicities while reaching out with the spirit of amity toward one another. And whereas chapter 163 of Acts of 2015 of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts establishes the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day. And whereas Amherst Town Meeting voted Article 29 of the May 20, 2015 session of the annual town meeting to establish the second Sunday of June as Race Amity Day and urge all the people of Amherst to recognize this event and to celebrate its annual observance, period. Now, therefore, the Amherst Town Council hereby proclaims Sunday, June 13, 2021, to be Race Amity Day, a celebration of oneness of the human family. Any other concerns with the language of this proclamation? 
Seeing none, I'm going to move directly to a motion to declare Race Amity Day annual proclamation to be clear, consistent, and actionable as amended. Second, the Angelus. Thank you, Pat has seconded. I see no further discussion. I'm going to directly to vote. I'll start with Mandy. Aye. Darcy. Aye. Pat. Aye. The chair is yes, and Sarah is absent. So the vote is four, zero with one absent. Um, this is so moved. All right. Just say that. Next item. What, what, what? We're moving on to another, this is a, under the 48 hour rule. This was sent to me and asked to be acted on by the council president. Again, I think it should go fairly quickly, but let's see. This is a committee charge. Part of our, uh, our charge is to review uh, council committee charges. So this is on the screen. Let me again, see if I can get it to be a little bit bigger. I checked this against our uh, template, and um, but we should probably look at the specific language briefly. Um, this is the audit request for the proposals review committee. That's a mouthful. An ad hoc council committee. It is appointing authority is charter section 2.6E and 5.8. It will have three town councilors chosen by the council and two town staff members is chosen by the town manager. Term of appointment is to July 30, 2021. Mandy, you have your hand raised. Council committees under charter section 2.2 are appointed by the president, not the town council. So this is 2.6. It should be, you're saying it should be changed. What is your, your change here? 2.6 is exercise of powers, quorum, adoption of measures, rules of procedure. Yep. And that the town council determines its own standing or ad hoc committees. If this is a committee, it's a council committee. And under 2.2, the president um, the president shall appoint members of and oversee all committees of the town council, whether standing or ad hoc. So 2.6 is how we create the committee, but 2.2 B says the council president is the one who appoints all members of committees of all committees of the town council, whether standing or ad hoc. But this has them chosen by the council. Right, which I believe is in violation of the charter. All right. So what it should read is three town councilors as chosen by the council president. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it should just read three town councilors and three town staff members, and they're all appointed by the council president. Two staff members. Right, so yeah, number of voting I'm, members I'm, would be five. Actually, number of voting members should be just say five because right. composition down below says how you compose that. All right. I think so it should say your suggestion five. Is, to, is to delete this. Excuse me. Um, Where did the charge come from? It came from the council president and also from, I believe Andy had a hand in it. Let me just... That changes on. That again. Yeah, normally we would just put five there. Right. All right. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, put that back on one strike, please. So that should say five, but the appointing authority is the town council president, the one above, technically. And so um, the references are correct. Yes. The appointing authority should be town council president. And then if you want to reference charter section 2.2B. 
So 2.6E, 2.2B, B, and 5.8. Thank you. There are no non voting members. There are no liaisons. The term of appointment is July 30th or until evaluation of applications and report to the town manager is complete. Staff support, town manager, designee, and clerk of the town council. Composition three members of the town council, two town staff members. And it is um, our rules of procedure, Mandy, or the charter that dictates. So it's the charter is what dictates the appointing authority, right. which is the town council president because it's an ad hoc council committee. Right, right. So that we don't need to get into that. That's already been taken care of and it's not stated here. Charter section five purpose. The town council shall adopt procedures for a selection of such accountant or firm. I mean, to, so I, the purpose is really to, to select or to recommend a accounting firm, accountant or audit, audit firm. <laughs> right. Right. That's really the purpose is to recommend to the town council an audit firm. Not your best work, my, uh, Mandy. It wasn't me. No, no, no. This Mandy had nothing to do with it. I had nothing this, to do with this one. <laughs> that's, 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 why, that's why it comes to us, uh, actually. It's me. I'm sorry, folks. I, I pulled no, no. just from the memo. Oh, I'm that's just teasing right. it. No, no, but no. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think it's to recommend to the town manager. Because the town manager is the only one who can who can um, right. sign the contract. Okay, so please continue, Mandy, to recommend to the town manager an accountant for or firm. An accountant or firm. Audit firm, uh, or 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 I think I can just say firm. I just yeah. took it from the charter section below. And so that is just which word do you want? You want firm or audit firm? Just do firm. Thank you. Or firm and uh, for the purposes for, of? Yeah. For the purposes of audit, annual audit or something. I'm going to strike this. You couldn't leave it in. Just period? Yeah. Charter section 5.8 states the town council shall adopt procedures for selection of such account or firm. Okay. All right. Um, charge the audit RP review committee shall receive applications from qualified auditing firms, evaluate applications utilizing the criteria in the RFP document, and deliver evaluation to the chief procurement officer, town manager, who will consider the qualitative rankings of each firm along with their price proposals. Report due to sorry. Report due to the chief procurement officer by July 30, 2021. Given those references, should the what we just added in purpose say chief procurement officer parentheses town manager? Just for consistency, yeah. Chief. That's a phrase I don't use too often. Chief procurement officer. Okay. Any other? Changes, observations, comments. So we have added a legal reference. We have got the correct appointing authority. We have the five voting members and we have made a slight change to the purpose. I think since you tracked everything just so that when things are accepted, you should actually highlight everything after five, the stuff that you lined through and actually just hit delete. So I'm going to delete. Yeah. And I think that's it. Is that the only thing that's been deleted? Yep. Okay, 
All right. Um, I'm going to uh, do this. I'm prepared to entertain a motion to declare the um, audit request for proposals review committee charge as amended to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Second. I'm going to move directly to a vote. This time I start with Mandy. Aye. Darcy. Yes. Pat. Aye. The chair is a, a yes, so it's four again, four zero with one absent. Um, thank you very much. Could we do a time check, George? It Just is 11.43 and we still have the DAB to do, which is extremely pressing. So I'm sorry, but um, things went off the rails in that first uh, review. I apologize, um, partly my fault, but um, I think we did still accomplish something important in that rather lengthy discussion, but it has taken us much longer than I'd hoped. Um, we had, we had had an objective of trying to get through the appointment process in two meetings. Yeah, that's not going to, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I understand that, but um, we also have to deal with the business that we have. And right now we have, um, let me get it up on the screen. We have DOB to deal with. Um, we have, A timeline we need to resolve. We have some questions about the process and timeline. Um, the charge has gone up. The um, official vacancy notice has gone up. The um, town council CAF form has been amended. So now anyone who is interested can uh, submit a CAF. And they can also, and they're directed uh, to, uh, find, they can find the charge. Um, and uh, we now need to establish a timeline and we need to um, make some decisions about the process. Um, Mandy Jo had provided some uh, thoughts which were in the packet. I then took uh, the process for GOL that's used for finance and um, made some changes to it so that in theory, as we go through it in the next half hour or so, um, any changes we come to agree on could be entered directly into that document. And then we would have an actual public document we could share both obviously with the council, but also with the public as to what the process is going to be. But we're going to need to um, decide on a process. We're also going to need to decide on, or at least review the timeline as it stands at the moment. So what I'm going to suggest, and but I'm open to your thoughts, is to put um, the document that will be hopefully the final process document up on the screen for me to amend as we go through it and hope that you all can access uh, Mandy's uh, document as we go, her comments and suggestions. The other option is to put hers up on the screen, um, but I'm going to have to be switching back and forth constantly to the, the master document. So let me just put that up for a moment and share the screen with you. Um, and if necessary, I'll take it down and we will uh, we'll do it differently. Um, so hang on for a second. Um, right now I've got, there we are, it's hiding. Share screen. All right. So what I've done is prepare what could potentially become the process document and could guide our discussion. Um, so the Town Council Committee on Governance Organization Legislation process to recommend appointments of voting members to the Districting Advisory Board. And based on charter section 7.4, and I just put the date here, we'll see if that actually happens. Um, and then, sorry, I'm using my, I might have had, uh, <laughs> I have a mouse issue today. Again, could you enlarge, George, if possible? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
Much better, thank you. So now I'm hoping you have access to Mandy's document. Um, if not, I might be able to put both documents up on the screen and we could go back and forth. Um, I, I can just read through mine as we hit each section, some of which are irrelevant right now. I understand. And so I'd like to use this as the, and it just go through it step by step and see where there are concerns or problems and see if we can resolve them. Um, as I've said, the sort of pre preliminaries have been taken care of. So everyone's clear on that. So the, the charge is up. Um, the links are available through the charge. The CAF has been amended and we've actually had one submission already. And every CAF will go directly to all counselors. So you all should have received that. I think it's the only one we've gotten so far. Um, and also the, the news and announcements will have an, an entry and also the it's put on the bulletin board. So um, we've begun the clock. Um, so in theory, within two weeks, after two weeks are up, we could then go to sufficiency of the pool. Um, so that clock has started. This is pretty much boilerplate. The chair of GOL shall write and submit to the town clerk for publication on the town bulletin board a vacancy notice done in accordance with charter section 9.12E. The chair shall also notify the board of registrars and the IT department that they need to recommend an appointment. I've actually reached out to the town manager. Um, he, as, as you recall, at the meeting, at the council meeting said he would take care of it, but I sent him an email. He has not responded to that particular one yet, but um, reminding him that he is, has agreed to do this. And I also offered to do it myself. And so far I haven't heard anything back, but I'm sure it will be taken care of. Um, but I will keep up on this. Um, when you say that they need to recommend an appointment, do you mean like that they need to advertise it? No, this is, uh, remember that th there are um, nine voting members, which is what we're focused on, but three non-voting members, um, we will recommend them to the council, but the, they will be, uh, their oh. names will be given to us by, uh, well, Sue Audette's name is, already, she's the town, she is the clerk, so her name is given. She will, I assume, um, uh, reach out to the board oh. of registrars and one of them will step forward, hopefully. Um, and then the IT person will be chosen by Sean Hannon or whoever. Um, so they will send us the three names and we will add them to our recommendation, but we'll have nothing to do with choosing those names. Yeah, maybe I should say re recommend an appointment of a non-voting member or something. The chair shall also notify the board of registrars and the IT department that they need to recommend an appointment. Of the relevant non-voting member. Okay. Right. Was that? Oh, and I just I yep. forget to do this. Oh, I do this all the time. I don't know if we totally need track changes here. Okay. All right. Well, let me put them in here anyway, just for the sake of I'm so unused to doing this. It's good though. It's good. It's kind of like you know, being chair of a committee is like life. When you finally figure out how to do it right, it's over. It's my word for wisdom for today. Community Action Activity Form, CAF. Individuals interested in serving as voting members of the District Advisory Board shall fill out CAF to express their interest in service. The CAF for this body is separate from the CAF for town manager appointed multiple member bodies and is automatically distributed to all counselors. The GOL chair shall reach out to all applicants to confirm receipt of their CAF. Do you want to say GOL chair or designee in case there are 40 of them that come in or whatever? I, I think that's a very good idea. Desig, I can't, that's another word I don't use too often. Designee or designee. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Darcy, because there may very well be a large number and it would be uh, a help to the chair if necessary. Okay, so that's item two. Item three, sufficiency of the pool. In accordance with Charter Section 912E, the vacancy notice must be published on the town bulletin board for a period not less than 14 days, any time after which GOL may assess the sufficiency of the applicant pool in making a determination regardless of the sufficiency of the applicant pool, GOL should consider the following factors. The number of applicants relative to the number of vacancies or impending vacancies, GOL strives for more applicants than vacancies. 
The demographic diversity of the applicant pool, GOL strives for a diverse applicant pool, including racial, economic, gender, and generational diversity. So I would add um, a bullet point about, it. So, so what I had recommended is determined by district and can be done and voted at different times because we have to have at least one and not more than two from any district. And so you can imagine we might get 20 applications CAFs, for example, and none are from, say, District 5. I'll just, you know, to pick something. Right. And so we could move forward with all the other districts while still dealing with District 5 issues, say. Um, so I think we need to evaluate it with respect to residential diversity separately. So how, again, I know you put this in your document. Um, I didn't how, actually write language for okay. it. All right. So we need to... to uh, you could just say the demographic diversity of the applicant pool comma including residential diversity due to the charge requirements or something like that or add a separate bullet point that says the residential diversity of the applicant pool or the locational diversity i don't even know what it is. <laughs> no i know it's awkward isn't it um district diversity um yeah, i don't know why that's not that should do a bullet, bullet point but it's not Ah, just start typing. Okay. So again, give me some wording. Um, the lo the location of re the diversity of the location of residents of the applicant pool. And down in the next paragraph where it says declare the applicable sufficient, I would just add a sentence that says app applicant, this declaration may be made on a district by district basis. Yeah. So not there, the end of I, the next paragraph. I'll have to go play with this. I'm sorry, end of this paragraph, I'm sorry. Yeah. This declaration may be made on a district by district basis or made on a district basis or something. I think that may be sufficient and we can just get yeah. rid of this. Especially since I can't seem to get the bullet points to work. Okay. Um, people okay with this? Again, we're going to do this wordsmith and try to move through it quickly, but we need to be in agreement because if we can, then we do have this and we can move ahead. Um, but the is, idea there a, is there a deadline? How does the, how does the declaration relate to the deadline. So well, the deadline is what the submission of statement of interests. Typically. Right. And so the declaration says we are moving forward. And so now there will be a hard deadline coming up. <laughs> oh, so it comes after the yes, the declaration of sufficiency of the pool, and then we still say you still have this much time left to okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Selection guidance. Selection voting members shall be based on the following. Diversity of residency, that's experience on past redistricting committees. Now, I took out the ORs here. Um, so I don't know if that bothers anybody. I consider these not, you know, um, these, are, these are, you know, things we consider, but they're not, uh, you don't get rejected because you don't have experience on a past redistricting committee. Um, I entered consistent availability for meetings particularly in light of tight timeline and summer vacations. I think that's gonna be crucial. Um, we make sure that everyone understands the time commitment and that it's immediate and it's focused. Um, and so somebody might very much wanna be on this and we might very much like them to be on it, but they're gonna be away for three weeks in the middle of the summer. Um, so that would be a serious problem. I don't think we want nine people in which every so often two or three of them just disappear to go go to the beach for a couple of weeks. So that's just so I thought I would include 
availability. And then mix of, yeah, go ahead, Darcy. For some reason why we wouldn't have the same diversity criteria for selection guidance that we have for the sufficiency of the pool? Yeah. I, why why are yeah. we looking for diversity and, mm -hmm. and yeah. all those categories that are in sufficiency of the pool? Why aren't we? I mean, obviously, we're not going to find that in every district, but why aren't, isn't that something that we would at least look for in our selection guidance? Mm -hmm. I'd be fine with pulling it down from the pool, the demographic diversity. Um, yeah. I guess my thought is we try, we try to get a pool in. that's diverse. Um, but in the actual selection, and now really, that Darcy raises a good point. In the actual selection, this is a factor that we consider. So it's more than just the pool, it's something that we would, you know, it's a consideration. So not mentioning it seems not seems it should be mentioned again even though it's up above it should be mentioned under selection criteria do you want to just cut or just copy this i, I think it's copy paste and then delete some stuff right it's, it's duplicate it's just modify it to read it properly okay and we'll add it at the end here sure okay now it works i don't know why The demographic diversity of the applicant pool. I think it's just demographic diversity and then move all the way to including. Right, exactly. Including racial, economic, gender, and generational good. I think that makes good sense. Okay. Diversity. All right. All right. I mean, if you're going for consistency in the third bullet point, get rid of the and, and in the fourth one, add a semicolon at the end. Thank you. In addition, the chair of GOL or designee shall solicit from the town clerk input as to whether there is any preferred knowledge, expertise, perspectives, or qualifications that the board might require to better assist it in its work. All right, now things are gonna get a little bit more interesting. Statement of interest. Um, you heard me at the council meeting. Um, I think I've been persuaded that um, a statement of interest is not an unreasonable thing to request. Um, so it sounds like there's a general sense from the council they would like something like an SOI at least. Um, not the CFs by themselves are not adequate. So after GOL declares the pool sufficient and adopts selection Guidance, the GOL chair or designee shall contact each individual in the applicant pool to solicit a statement of interest. The GOL chair or designee shall include in their solicitation a copy of the committee charge, a link to the relevant MGL section. So some of this is taken from Mandy's language, as you, as you will see, because I would never would have thought of that, and we're going to ask about that, but a link to the relevant MGL section, the charter reference, and the adopted selection guidance. I think the rest of this is boilerplate from um, our usual process. Maybe 700 words seems too long, um, but to SOI shall describe why the applicant is interested in serving on the body and the relevant skills and experiences they will bring to the body that align with the adopted selection guidance. It shall include an explicit acknowledgement. This is my addition. It shall include an explicit acknowledgement of the timeline and their availability. Where is that? Yeah, that's that's me, and I, I'm asking myself what I, what I wanted to try to to uh, request in the SOI is that the individual actually acknowledge in their SOI that they understand the time frame. And that they are available during that time frame. And maybe that's too much. Maybe that's something we can do in another way. Uh, go ahead. I liked it, but I think we should 
in you know the committee charge and all when we're sending stuff to them add the timeline then so we would send them so including a time so just so up here up here just add timeline of work or something yeah yeah okay just pick a right. comment section to right. do it um I don't want to call it committee timeline or um, timeline of or, or 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 yeah timeline of committee work or something. Yeah, I can wordsmith it, but um, really it's uh, okay. okay. I'm not happy with that. Happy with that. Okay. Um, so let me see if that wording is so. Geo uh, should establish. Okay. Well, it's because we shall include. Yeah, what's the it here? I guess is my question for myself. It shall include the the statement of interest shall include. Yeah, and that that's really going to be hard to enforce. I mean, you know, we get an SOI from somebody, and it's fine, but nowhere in the SOI do they actually say that they are available for that time frame. Are we going to throw it out? Um, probably not. So. Um, uh, you could write applicants shall explicitly acknowledge the time committee timeline and their availability. And that uh -huh. would allow you if it does, if it's not included in the SOI to go back and ask them to do so. Well, maybe then that sentence does it really. It shall include an explicit acknowledgement of the timeline and their availability. And your point is that if we don't find it in the document, that's an opportunity for us to reach out to them and just confirm. Yeah. Okay. Resumes and attachments will not be accepted. We do not take resumes. Um, we do not take attachments. It's just the SOI. Joe Chair designation shall establish a deadline for submission. Any applicant who does not submit their SOI by the established deadline uh, shall be considered withdrawn from the applicant pool. So we are considering the SOI a requirement along with the CAS. Okay. I highlighted the rest of this in yellow because it raises the question of interviews and whether we're going to do formal interviews. Um, and that's a, a question that I think there's a lot of dis there's disagreement about. Um, at the moment, it says all applicants SOI shall be posted to the meeting packet on the town website at the same time, at least one week in advance of the date for interviews. We are, I don't think, I may be wrong on this, but I don't think we're going to be interviewing all these folks in one fell swoop one thought was that given their SOIs, we could give ourselves the uh, flexibility to reach out to people individually to follow up if we thought it was necessary. Um, or do you as a committee want to interview um, in some fashion every single applicant? Do you want to reach out to them by phone um, or in a group meeting or a uh, you know, committee meeting and interview every single one of them? Um, or do you want to have a situation where if we feel it's needed, we can reach out to an individual as a follow-up to an SOI if we had a question? Now that creates an uneven playing field, that's a concern. Um, on the other hand, well, so that's the issue. Um, I've already spoken, I think in public to my, reluctance to say the least, that we formally interview everyone. Um, but I need to hear your thoughts. Mandy. Is that a commentary? <laughs> I don't know what that was. Is that? Your crickets. <laughs> You're hearing crickets. <laughs> okay. So I heard fairly clearly, at least I think I, I interpreted what I heard on Monday night that interviews were not necessary. Um, so I think, you know, I would move to deleting the interview section completely and having the statements of interest posted five days or pick a time period before the GOL, the, before the meeting GOL will discuss recommendations at. Okay, I mean, I, I would be personally sympathetic to that, but I am concerned about the question of, uh, since it applies to everybody, in that sense, it's, 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 it's everyone's on the same level playing field. Um, it's strictly the SOIs, but what if a question arises um, 
because we just, you know, the SOI is the SOI. We just, we just deal with it. We just do our best to interpret it. Um, we do have the authority, at least it sounds like you're giving me or my designee the authority to reach out to someone who doesn't acknowledge the timeline to simply reach out to them and say, we just want to confirm that you understand because you didn't say in your SOI, that you understand that this is X month to X month and that you will be available. And the person will say either, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. Or they'll say, absolutely, yes. And then that's the end of the discussion. Right. Um, so I'm understanding you to say that's permissible. But me calling up somebody and just saying, you know, I saw you submitted an SOI. Um, tell me more about yourself and da, 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 da. That is not permissible. Um, we're not going to be doing selective follow-up interviews of individuals for whatever reason. Um, we're simply going to rely on the SOIs, and if necessary, for the sake of the timeline alone, we would reach out to them. Darcy. Yeah, I expressed that at this at the town council meeting, but I, I guess I feel like um, if someone applies and nobody, none of us have ever heard of the person, um, and they look reasonably good on paper, um, but we don't know anything about them. And um, it seems to me that it makes sense. I, this is why I, I prefer having telephone interviews and just like assigning each one of us to call 10 people and ask them exactly the same questions and then report back to all of us what they all said and and what our impression was because you know there's some things that you can pick up in a phone call that you definitely can't pick up from a paper application um, that are either great or they're you know like a red flag so um, I guess I I I feel like it's I don't want it to be that you know these are these are all people that we all know. Um, I'm assuming there'll be a bunch of people that we don't know that are applying. Um, so what do we do with them? I think one concern I have, Darcy, is that that obviously a phone call. Say I call someone and have a conversation, and then I report back to you what what I heard. That's no longer in the public. Domain. The SOIs are in the public domain. Our conversations about the SOIs are in the public domain. Um, it's something anyone can access. They can they can they can see the video. Um, they could read the SOI. But my conversation with X, Y, or Z, getting to quote unquote know them better, is ultimately you know my conversation. It's not recorded, and it's and you're just going to get my version of it. So I think that that the fact that maybe somebody we don't know could be maybe even a plus in their favor, especially if their SOI is strong. I think also, if I may say this, we all have contacts in the community and there's nothing that prevents an individual council or a member of this committee from talking to their friends and associates and say, do you know X? And they say, yeah. And they say, well, what do you know about them? And they say, you know, they're great or whatever. Um, so I don't think there's anything that, that prohibits or should prohibit you from using your own personal network to learn about someone. But when we're doing interviews, the field now gets uneven. So Smith and Jones and Riley got personal phone calls from members of the committee, but a whole bunch of other people didn't. So I hear you, what you're saying is then we need to do everybody. And that means that all those conversations then need to be reported to the committee at a committee meeting and on and on, and pretty soon we are just up, we're just buried. And, and in the end, the conversations are only what I tell you, you know? Now maybe we spend most of the time talking about the Red Sox, but at the end we talked about, you know, so I'm worried about the, the load on the committee. I'm worried about the even playing field. I hear that you're saying, well, I, we, none of us have heard of X before, but, um, we have the SOI and we have our own ability to reach out in the community to our friends and neighbors. Um, 
I think that's sufficient. Yeah, I guess I'm just saying that the, the person who none of us know, and we may not even know people who know that person, does that person have a chance of ever getting appointed if nobody knows them and they we only see what they have on paper? I don't know. I, I, I think that's always a challenge. Um, and that's why interviews matter. And I think normally if this were a normal situation where we're not under a time constraint, um, but here we have some, and we're also under geographical, and we're all sorts of constraints here. Yeah. So we might have 30 excellent candidates from district three, and we only get to pick two. And we may have no or very few candidates from district say, I don't know, one, but we still have to find two. At right. least two, at least one, right? So we may be forced to make some decisions that, you know, in the best of all possible worlds, we'd prefer not to, but so the constraints here, the time constraints, the geographical constraints, the most important is, you know, not to over formalize this. Or as I said, Tassinari, when she saw what we had, she was just blown away, not in a necessarily good sense, but just like, I've never seen anything so formal in 30 years in the Secretary of State's office for this kind of thing. She's been through three censuses. So I like Mandy's idea of no interviews, with the exception of if we have an SOI where it's not clear the person understands the time commitment, that we would then authorize the chair. It probably should just be the chair um, to reach out to them and just confirm. Perhaps by email would be the best way to do it. Um, to reach out and just confirm that they understand the time commitment. And if we don't get that confirmation back, that would be an important consideration in choosing them. Namely, it would be a very negative one. But other than that, I think it would be unwise, personally speaking, for us to engage in one-on-one -on -one interviews and then reporting that back to the committee. And also we have to come up with a set of questions. So we have to come up with four or five questions. And really the only question well, I mean, the question you ask them is, tell me about yourself. <laughs> you know, right. who are you? What, what do you, you know, and that's, you know, and that's what the SOI is for. The SOI says, you know, and I'll try, we'll try to make it clear when we reach out to everybody. Um, it basically, uh, where does it say? Um, describe why you're interested and what skills or experiences you bring to the body that align with what this body is doing. So that's ample opportunity for them to articulate who they are from, yeah. our, from our particular experience. So I think we're, we've covered here. What, what about the rest of you? Interviews or no? Your face didn't use Pat. Any thoughts, Pat, on that at all? Do you wanna have interviews? I don't wanna do interviews in this. I think that we can learn a lot from the SOIs. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, this is not, yeah, that's enough. I, I don't think we need direct interviews. Yeah. So what that means, if we go this route, and I'm saying we haven't decided yet, but if we go this route, then once we have um, the SOIs and we've declared a particular, maybe we'll do all of them at once, but let's say we've got three districts where, um, we can go ahead as a committee and review the SOIs and choose people or make recommendations for those districts while we continue to work on other districts um, and hopefully meet the deadline of June 21. And so I'm going to, for the moment, just put a strike through here. I'm not going to delete it yet, but um, we're suggesting that interviews. Um, Okay. We have to look above and it says, because at least one week in advance of the date for interviews. So we have to clarify that if we're not having interviews. Yeah, it should be one week in advance of the meeting GOL will consider recommendations at. And where is that, guys? I'm sorry, I can't. Find in your it. yellow you highlight under that? statement of interest. Oh, yeah, just above. Any applicant who does not submit the rest of it by the established deadline. Well, that deadline is just um, no. Keep keep down lower. Yellow, yellow. Uh, I was going to take out all. The, yeah, I was going to say that whole oh, yellow goes out. No. No. Oh, yellow is about that posting on the website. Okay. So it just needs modified. Okay. So, 
So maybe that's that. all applicants. Okay, let's do it. All applicants SOI shall be posted to the meeting packet on the town website at the same time. Period. That's what I would suggest. You don't want to establish a deadline. I think we need a deadline. Okay, I'll still be posting in the website time by the deadline as established by the GOL chair. No, with at, so if you didn't delete, if you undelete what you just deleted. Okay, thank you. At least one week in advance of the date for the meeting they are to be considered at. So all of this, that's why I shall be posted to the meeting packet on the town website at the same time, at least one week in advance of the date for the meeting they are to be considered at. Let's think about that quickly. What I'm concerned is that SOIs be publicly available and people can read them. And obviously, I, you know, and one week perhaps is not an unreasonable period of time, but let's say somebody's just late. Uh, does that, is that again, basically means they're out of the running? Yeah. We yeah, can't, we can't the accept that. For two days or a day before when they have to be right. posted. And if they're not, they don't make it, they're out. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, that's why I shall be attached to the public meeting posting to provide additional access by the public. I assume that's still applicable. Mm -hmm. The GOL chair or designee shall notify the town council the SOIs have been posted. Now this will be done, it sounds like in, 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 in state, it may be done in stages. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so we might wanna modify the at the same time to per or all something about districts or something. Yeah. We posted all applicants SOIs shall be posted in the packet. SOI. For the meeting where district. Where their district. Will be considered or yeah. Yeah. from their district will be considered. Good. Yeah. Get rid of the ad. Right. Yeah. Eighth grade English teacher would, would just oh, <laughs> be so unhappy. She'd be thrilled that you got rid of the hanging. Yeah, <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, Ryan learned something in his class. Yeah, okay. really. I didn't like that one either. <laughs> All right. So that is statement of interest. We are going to eliminate interviews, is what we're suggesting. We'll still come back to that. Recommendation at the meeting of the or the next. Regular special GOL meeting of the computer. Okay, let's see. At, at that meeting, or, okay, this is a, this is confusing. Yeah. Oh, so just at at the meet. So there's no interviews. So yeah. I think you can get rid of the whole first sentence. Yeah. Okay. GOL shall seek to minimize the time between interviews and and oh, an no, expected yeah. town council vote. Jill may choose not to, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so it's between statement of interest publication. GOL shall seek to minimize the time between, sorry, between recommendation and expected town council vote. Uh, and no, I think delete the first sentence. Right. And right. in the second sentence, change interviews to recommendation. It uh, between yeah, recommendations and an expected town vote. We may choose not to make, you know, that's going to come out. Well, if we don't have a. Well, we have to get nine people on that body. No, 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 but if say we don't have a applicant pool for district two, I'm going to pick on two this time. Right. <laughs> we might be making recommendations for eight of nine. Um, <laughs> Right. All right. Because we need at least one person from every right. district. I think yeah. we're going to have that in spades, but. That's my guess, but. So maybe it just strike that sentence. GOL may recommend fewer appointments than vacancies or impending. Well, this again is, is we're trying to fit this to another. Oh, yeah. I, 
maybe we can strike the fewer appointments. Or maybe, yeah. I would just leave it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we can't really recommend fewer appointments. No. We have to have one. <laughs> no. We have to, right. Yeah. I think it's just where shall uh, do we what, shall we let's just name, name of the applicant, uh, dates of appointment. Okay. I think we, we should put district, district, yeah. residents of district or district residing in or something. Uh, since that's a requirement. Yeah. I don't know why this is not automatically doing a. Um, when you want demographic, okay. okay. I don't know why it's not doing it. It's all right, I'll have to fix this later. Okay, sorry. And the demographic information on the overall applicant pool. Um, and I had one other thing to add and I'm not sure how we would add it. Um, no we should somehow add to th that GOL will essentially pass through the recommended appointments from the board and the IT department. I don't know how to put that in there. Do we need to? Do we need to is the question. I'm not sure. I mean, essentially, when we submit our recommendations, we'll also include the name of Suadet, the name of somebody from IT, and one of the three, hopefully, I mean, it's possible that all three members of the board of registrars will say, I'm just not here. I'm just not available. And at, so at that point, we won't be recommending any one of them. Um, we don't know that, that any one of them is available. Um, we assume, obviously, the town clerk will be available. We assume that the IT person will show up because they, they're an employee of the town. Right. But the board of registrars, it could be that, that the three, all three of them are saying, look, I'm going to be away during that period. Or I just don't want to do it. Um, so I don't know, I, okay. I think we're just gonna, we'll, we'll give them what we've got. I don't think we need to have that in here. This document is really concerned about the appointment of, of voting members and I'm not, um, and the process for selecting those voting members. And what you're saying here is that, um, I think the first sentence is not really needed, but it just, you know, okay, we're gonna try to minimize time we may choose not to make a recommendation, means something like, you know, at, at a particular moment, we may still have a district we haven't been able to get enough volunteers for, I guess. GOL may also recommend fewer appointments than vacancies or pending vacancies. Again, I'm not sure what the point of any of this language is, but what is important is that GOL will include the name of the applicant, um, the dates of appointment, reasons for recommending. Um, I assume that a sentence or two, right? Just like we'd expect from Paul, some kind of you know, justification, okay? And then demographic information on the overall applicant pool. So, um, okay. So I, the report would also say there were 30 applicants and in the broad terms that we use, you know, they fell into these age categories. They self-identified in these uh, racial categories, um, that kind of thing. George, a very minor thing. I yeah. think the district that the applicant is from should be go up with name dates, not be between reasons for the recommendation and then demographic information. Um, I think it, it should be name of applicant uh, and name and district of the applicant. Oh, yeah. Name and district of applicant recommended. That solves my problem with this as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> You're making I don't know why it's doing this. I didn't, <laughs> uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what we have is, um, I still think this is overkill, but I think it's not worth arguing about. Um, the main point is this. I think really, I think that's all that needs to be here, but I'm gonna leave it, that's okay. We are suggesting to do away with interviews. Um, I will get rid of the yellow because that's no longer needed. 
Um, okay. All right. Can I make a motion? Uh, I'm willing to entertain a motion, yes. I move to adopt the Town Council Committee on Governance Organization Legislation process to recommend appointments of voting members to the district Districting Advisory Board as amended on May 5th, 2021. Second. There's a motion made and seconded. Um, any further discussion, questions, comments? Yeah, I just have a question for the Please, group. Please, go ahead. And that is, um, are we as a group open to appointing someone who uh, no one knows? Of course. Yes. Yeah, based on the SOI, absolutely. I mean. I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. I mean, so, yeah. so sight unseen we have never spoken to the person no don't know them otherwise but we're open to appointing them based on their soi i, I hear you darcy but i think the answer is yes okay just wanted to check no i know i know it's it's not ideal i agree with you so part of the reason for doing this is simply because of the time pressures and maybe that's not a very i think it's a good reason but yeah so yes. All right, um, I'm gonna give it to the chair this time. The chair votes yes. Um, Mandy. Aye. Uh, Pat. Aye. Darcy. Yes. Okay, so again, the vote is four zero with one absent to, uh, so I'm gonna stop this. All right, we need to do a time check. It is 12.30. Um, I do wanna look at the timeline with you. I really, do, but I understand that you have other commitments. Um, and, as far as the minutes, we don't have to worry about that. Um, we uh, obviously have not gotten to something very important, and I apologize, but I don't. And it certainly will be leading the list again in, in two weeks' time. Um, but you see what happens. We get you know, a charge that certainly has to be dealt with right away. And of course, we saw what happened with the first item. But I will do everything in my power to uh, get that addressed at the next meeting. Um, but I don't think we have time to deal with it today. But I'm, I'm, if people want to stay longer, um, but I don't think we have the time. It's going to take a good hour to work through that document. Um, we do need to look at the timeline just briefly, and because I would like to get that out. Mandy? Oh, I just wanted to, to comment as chair of CRC that um, draft selection guidance, including input from the chairs will be posted later this week for CRC to be considering. And it might, um, given what that says now, it might ease some concerns. So I would encourage people to look at that draft when the, when the um, posting, the packet goes up later this week for CRC's meeting next week. Okay, so maybe that could be okay. included in the uh, GOL packet for our it, two weeks. It's a draft, you know, we're, we're going to be adopting it next week, but okay. it will be a public document as of when the packet goes up, and okay. that may ease some concerns. Okay. But could you send us when it goes up, Mandy, a copy? I would try, yeah. Thanks. All right, so if you'll bear with me, and again, I understand if people have to go, um, but uh, this should take about 10 minutes at the most, and then I'm going to pretty much adjourn us. Um, yeah. But um, we're at stop at 12.45 because I Okay, all right, so I really do. So let me just get DAB open here quickly. I'm sorry, wrong file, right, right file. Um, okay. FYI, uh, we've had uh, four, four DAB applications this morning. Good, now I think that this is encouraging. I mean, the fear is of course we'll have so many <laughs> the chair will be done in, but um, all right. All right, now I can't find it. That's really bad. Um, I, I take it back, it is here. Okay, let me just open this. Um, share screen. Okay. All right. Is that visible? Yep. All right, so. Um, uh, at the most 10 minutes, and I just need your thoughts and suggestions. Um, I'd like to start sharing this with people, but finalized process, timeline for recruiting, interviewing, and recommending appointees. We have, I think, done that. We have now a process. 
we haven't had the timeline actually we're going to do we have a process um and that we're getting applicants the vacancy notice has been posted at the council meeting and I, all of you obviously been doing this urging people to reach out to candidates in their district and encourage them to apply i'm suggesting may 19th as a, so that is literally two weeks from today, our next meeting, that we could begin to declare specific pools sufficient. So let's say three of the five districts um, have enough applicants. We could declare those three sufficient and we could proceed to um, beginning to review the, uh, well, actually let's think for a second. Um, we have to set, I'm sorry, I'm thinking out loud here, I apologize. Um, we have to give people time. We have to notify people that they need to submit an SOI because now we've agreed they need to submit an SOI. Um, do you want me to do that when I reach out to them to say we've gotten their CAFs? Um, I would, in other words, give them all the information that you've asked me to give them at that point because that would get the process started, Mandy. So I think we work back from make recommendation to the council on June 16th, given what we just adopted, the SOIs need posted on June 9th um, on the meeting packet, which means they should probably be due June 7th. Yeah. To give you time to collect them and, and give Athena time to get them posted, assuming there's a lot. So post SOIs on June 9th, SOI submission deadline would be June 7th. And sorry, I, I had to do this for two different appointments. So it's just like all in my head about how to figure That's, this out. No, this is not um, any reason to apologize. This is great. So SOIs will be due June 7th or so then. Um, we have to watch our uh, committee. I'm sorry. Somebody needs to watch our committee dates. Um, I've got them here somewhere. So yes. um, we have May 19th, June 2nd. And I'm uh, sorry. Right. June yeah. 2nd, the other meeting. So SOI is due to the chair June 7th. SOI is um, due to the chair. So this is submission deadline for SOI. Yeah, that's the submission deadline, June this, 7th. This. And you can pick a time on June 7. Um, so you can start declaring the pool sufficient on May 19th. The last date to declare the pool sufficient would be June 2nd. Um, and both of those days, depending on how we've declared the pool, should be adoption of selection guidance. Because right. the selection right. guidance needs sent to the candidates when soliciting the SOIs. Yeah. So the same day we declare pool sufficient, we should, we should just adopt the selection guidance on May 19th, whether or not we've declared the pool sufficient. Okay, declare pool sufficient. Okay, let's do it this way. Adopt. Good job, George. Guidance. <laughs> uh, now this is. I'm, it's I, working I, I, with this one. I have a so future. We just do that May nineteenth, which means today or something. You should give um, Sue ask Sue to provide some input for the selection guidance because we'll need her input in order to adopt the selection guidance. So that's today. Um, Reach out to Sue. Yeah. And then you can always add in all the other stuff. Once the pool's declared sufficient is when you send everything out, but that's just your sort of stuff. Right, and we don't need to get into that. Um, this is just helpful reminder for me. Yep. That's not really necessary either, but it's just there because I could need a reminder. Uh, the rest of that I can weigh. So let's look at this just briefly. Um, so, because um, our goal eventually June 21 um, is when the council appoints. So our meeting is June 16th. And at that meeting, we may have already uh, made some preliminary recommendations, but, or maybe we'll do them all at once. But the, the thought is we would prepare, and then I would have a few days to prepare a memo or report that would have all these names in it and all the stuff that you've asked me to do. And that goes to the council on the 21st and hopefully they say, 
yes, they approve it. Now the rest of this is pure speculation. And I, we don't, we're not gonna decide here, but the, the thinking is within a week or two weeks, the AB could begin meeting. They, according to Sue Audet, there is some training that I think they do undergo and that could take place in the month of July. Maybe it's only one meeting, I don't know. Legacy files become available on August 15th. Census numbers are available. So they can start doing actual work as with real numbers or numbers at least by August 15th. Then they do tweaking once they get the official numbers on the 30th. Um, they have to have uh, uh, basically their um, report, I guess, right? So their report to the town council, is that what we're at? What are we asking them to do? What, what's actually, what, they, they do this redistricting. For all the then, districts and we have to adopt them. But right. they, they have to submit something to us. They have to submit their, their a a report, a map. So, um, uh, so, and that would also come to us. Um, all right. So our vote is on the 18th. Um, so they have to be, there has to, report has to be completed. Completed by when? Certainly not October 18th, um, but it has to be completed in time to be submitted to the council for the council to read and to ponder. And for people to see it too, because if we're only getting one shot at a vote. Yeah, see, that's a concern. Um, I mean, I just don't know how, I mean, my hope is this won't be there. I mean, terribly complicated, but you know, who knows? If people are unhappy about it, if there's need for a further meeting, we don't have one. But the, our meeting is, um, what is it, the 4th of October? We have one on the 4th and one on the 18th. The 11th is, is Indigenous P Peoples Day. Right. So in theory. The report by the 8th, potentially. But that would not allow us to look at it on the, you still only have one meeting. We could, we could deal but with But it would allow the public a week. Let's just put it in here for the sake of argument for the moment. Um, I mean, again, look, look, look how little time that gives them. You know, September 30th to October 4th. I don't see how they could possibly, I mean. I have a feeling we're gonna be having another council meeting in October. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm not gonna put that date. That date's unrealistic. I think I'm just going to leave it blank. Um, the only fixed deadline that I understand is the 30th. Right. But, um, and this, just again, just a final note. Um, this is from Sue Adet. Um, this is her email, basically just copied for you to see. Um, these are her words. So, all right. Um, I appreciate any other thoughts on the timeline. So I'm gonna be using this um, for the moment in communication with Sue in communication with Paul and with the public, at least with the parts that relate to the applications. You know, it might be, and this is slightly unrelated, but um, it probably would be helpful to the chair and others um, if the CAF were modified so that you're asking the question, what district, so that you don't have to look up everybody's address. Yeah, yeah. Um, up, up to you, but um, that, you know, you're gonna have to look up all the addresses to see what district they're in. Yeah, If you don't true. already know. I'm, yeah. If I can interject, there's not an easy way of doing that in our, our um, system, in yeah. our website, there's, there's not an easy way of inserting a field that allows somebody to look up their district and then insert it into that form field. So some, someone would have to know or else go to a different page to look it up and then insert it. So it's like, it would be a multi-step kind of thing. And the, the CIFs, as you mentioned, are already coming in. That's true. Um, again, the chair can handle it. I mean, one option, I mean, I have to reach out to everybody anyway and say, thank you, you've got your CAF, stay tuned. Um, I could ask them to just, could you please uh, send back an email or just tell me what district you're in? 
And if they don't, then I'll look it up, but I could do that. Um, let me just take one last. Um, okay. Just on this document, when am I sending out on May 19th is when I would be sending out, no, it would be June 2nd. So well, no. You would when, send out once the pool is declared sufficient and you have selection guidance, you'd, you'd send the solicitation for statement of interests to the applicants. So it would be May 9th, but no. So it could be May 19th after the meeting. It could be, it could end up being June 2nd after the meeting. It might be different times depending on different districts. Okay, so what I want to, I did, and this is for me and I apologize, but just for my sake, for my sanity, what we call this what, just- um, Solicit SOIs yeah. from applicants. Solicit. And I apologize, I need to leave. That's all right, no apology necessary. Pat, thank you for hanging in there. George, I would suggest including, when you solicit the SOIs, just uh, send a link. I can send it to you to the map page so that if they don't have their districts, they can look it up. And then send it included in the SOIs that way. Okay, so solicit SOIs with map link to the district. And again, I'll put May 19th, put the question mark, but around then. All right, any other, th this is very helpful for the chair. I appreciate it. Um, at the moment, I'm thinking I can handle this. Um, though at some point I may turn to you for some help, but I think it's it's easier if one person is responsible. So if anything goes wrong, we know who to uh, to go to. Um, so, um, any final thoughts or any additions? It's very appreciated. Thank you all, uh, Darcy, Mandy, and Pat. Now, and of course Athena. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you. <laughs> find that something's not happening that's supposed to be happening. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing. Let me just save this. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see your faces. Um, so obviously, we did not get to the uh, council appointment policy, but we will very much work for have move heaven and earth to get to it next meeting. Mandy's also mentioned that there's a document that we can consult that may address some concerns, but we'll see how that works out in two weeks. Um, and I will get busy on uh, finance. I was going to send, put up the finance committee notice. Remember, we also have a finance appointment to make. Um, I was just going to put out the uh, uh, vacancy notice, which has not changed. The only thing that's changed in the vacancy notice is that Mandy in, her, in the CRC notices, she reminds people that if your CAF has been out there for less than three years, you don't need to submit another CEF. So I added that. But other than that, I did not touch it. So I'm just alerting you that I was going to do that. We're not under any super rush, but uh, I just want to do it so I don't forget. And we will need at, at the next meeting or soon to uh, go through our own process for finance and come to an agreement about it so we can adopt it. So that tentatively would be on the agenda for next time, um, but it would take second place to the appointments policy since that's been put off for today. But I hope to get to it next time. Just go through it and make sure we're in agreement and when we're not, see if we can come to some consensus so that we know what that's gonna be. No objection to putting up the finance vacancy notice? Okay. Any other items for next? So the next agenda essentially would be as I just said, those two items. And then obviously whatever comes our way, hopefully nothing, hopefully we'll have just those two things plus sets of minutes. All right, I'm ready to declare this meeting adjourned. I thank you all for your patience. Um, thank you, Emily, as always, and Athena, of course. Um, all right, go well. Thank you, George. Yeah, take care.